This conference will now be recorded.
Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me, guys? Yeah, yes, sir. Okay, so shall we start now? Yeah. So we'll start with our first service uh, application services. Now, from here onwards, whatever the services that we'll see is. Lalit, can you hold for a moment? Yeah, sure. I <laughs> All right. So from now on, whatever the services that we see is really very important from exam perspective. And also for designing as a solution, okay, you must know all these services. So from here, we will see the three application services, SNS, SQS, SES, and then we'll see CloudWatch and Cloud Trail services, which is the error shielding and monitoring services. Then we'll see server services called as Lambda. And then finally, we'll see the cloud formation, the Bell Architecture Framework. So let's begin with the application services. We have first application service called SQS. Now, definitely in your exam, if you are trying to go for exam, then you will get two to three questions on SQS for sure. So what is SQS? SQS is basically simple queuing service, a queue to store your messages as to a queue to, uh, to keep your messages until the processor or the consumer consumes such messages. Amazon SQS is a web service that gives you access to message queue that can be used to store messages while waiting for a computer to process them. So until a consumer consumes that messages, the message will be always in the queue. Now a queue is not a a queue is always a part of any application you see. Maybe a financial site, maybe a banking site, maybe a, a e-commerce site, or maybe a, any transaction processing site. Every site will have, every application will require a queuing system. Now, instead of designing your own queuing system to invest your time in designing and maintaining that queuing system in one of the application, AWS offers you a direct queuing services by its own managed services. You just need to integrate this SQS in your application and you can work and you can start on processing of your data. So that is SQS. So can you guys tell me any example of SQS? Have you ever used any queuing system? Notification. Uh, yes, sir. Microsoft Message Queue we use. Sorry, one second. Pardon, your voice is breaking. MSM Queue, Microsoft Message Queue. Okay, Microsoft Message Queue. All right. So just like similar to that queuing services, we have a Amazon SQS. No. All right. 
if you want to see the real time example of a QA service, then whenever you have a Amazon sale on Amazon.in site, whenever there is a sale, just try to visit that site and try to create an order. So what happened basically whenever you go to Amazon site when there is a sale, you are allowed to click on add to cart. So whenever you click on add to cart, if that add to cart button is successfully clicked, then you are entered to a queue. Your account details and other details which product you are purchasing that all this information goes under a queue. So now on this queue, the messages, whatever you have, the, your user ID, your uh, account ID, and the products that you want to purchase, all goes into a queue to a backend terminal where you do slowly the payment processor or the address billing details, etc. So the only thing is to enter the queue, you need to be successfully enter into the add to cart button. Once you have successfully click on the add to cart button, you are passed into a queuing service. Now Amazon SQS is a distributor system that enable web services application to quickly and reliably queue messages that one component in an application generates to be consumed by another component. That means until the consumer consumes the messages, let's say there are two EC2 machines, one is producer, second is consumer. And in between the two EC2 machine, there is a queue. So first EC2 machine will generate a message and deliver it to queue. So until the second EC2 machine consumes the messages from the queue, the message. All right. So queue is a temporary repository for message that are waiting for a processor. Now there are two types of queue. First is a standard queue and second is a FIFO queue that is first in first out. The difference is a standard queue is the default queue. If you do not choose any one of the queue type, then it always a standard queue, default queue. Now standard queue offers you unlimited number of transaction per second. There is no limit of how many transactions you can do per second. Standard queue generates that a message is delivered at least one. It guarantees that the message that is coming will be delivered at least one, which means at least one means there may be duplication. However, sometimes more than one copy is given. So it means there are duplication which is allowed in the standard queue. Though they maintain at least one only, but it says there may be a, another copy will be delivered. The same message will be delivered twice or thrice, but it guarantees that the message will be delivered at least once. And it doesn't ensure that the way the message is arrived will be delivered in the same way. It ensures that messages are generally delivered, generally delivered, but it doesn't guarantee about that part that the way of the messages arrive in the same way it will be delivered. Whereas in the FIFO queue, the message is delivered exactly once. And the order in which the message is arrived in the same way the messages will be delivered in a queue. Now in this part, duplications are not allowed. The messages will be delivered exactly once. No duplication will be allowed. But the limitation of the FIFO queue is 3,300 transactions per second. Now a basic part of the SQS is, SQS is pool based, not push based. Which means whenever you store a messages on SQS, the another processor needs to accept that uh, needs to pull the messages from the queue. SQS itself will not deliver the message or it will not itself push the message to another service. The another service needs to manually push the pull the service, pull the messages from the SQS. So it's more likely SQS is a pull base, not push base. Messages can be a maximum of 256 KB in size. We cannot go beyond the 256 KB. Messages kept, can be kept in queue from one minute to 14 days and the default duration of this period is four days. SQS guarantees that the message will be delivered at least once. Now exam point of view questions are, definitely this kind of questions can be asked. What is the detention period of a queue? What is the standard detention period? 
at that time you should choose for the four days minimum will be one minute maximum can be 14 days but the default limit is four days the another message can be which one of the services is pull page and which one of the services push page so there will be question like which services which application service is pull based and which services are push based at that time must remember sqs is pull based and sns is push based you need to pull messages from the queue that's why the sqs is a pull based and sns can deliver the message for you that is it can send push notification so that is push based uh, system now coming to the difference between a standard queue and the fifo queue standard queue is unlimited number of transactions per second whereas the fifo queue is limited to 300 transactions per second standard queue guarantees that the message will be delivered at least once but the FIFO queue guarantees the message will be delivered exactly one. So standard queues is having a duplication. There will be a duplication in the standard queue. Whereas in the FIFO queue, there will be a no duplication. So these are the difference between standard and the FIFO. And the last difference is the messages that are arrived in the FIFO queue will be delivered in the same way. Whereas in the standard one, it doesn't guarantee about that. So these are the four different differences between the FIFO queue and the standard queue. And the common things are SQS are pull based, not push based. Messages size can be maximum up to 256 KB in size. The retention period is from minimum one minute to 14 days, and the default is four days. All right. Any questions in doubt in this part? SQS. Yes, anyone? All right. Let me know if you have any other questions. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 I think you just explained about that uh, the number of services, right? Uh, at least once and at most once. Yeah. Uh, are they using uh, publish and subscribe architecture for this? Yes. Uh, what is the the protocol they are using? Uh, the backend uh, is there like uh, uh, yes so for this, yeah for this there, there is no require for any protocol. Basically, all these transactions are dependent on the IAM rule. So once you have this IAM rule, the from the backend link, from the private link, all mm -hmm. the communication will be made. <laughs> Sorry, one second. Can you please give me the some examples where uh, we can, we can use these services? All right. Like when you have two kinds of transactions needs to be processed. Like for example, in a banking transaction, whenever you do any NFT transaction, it is not very quick. It goes under certain process. It checks the recipient and the sender's address, uh, all the account IDs and everything, and then it processes the your transaction. So how it works? Basically, whenever you fill a form to send a recipient NFT details, it goes under a message queue, where the another processor consumes this process and checks whether the sender and the recipient are having the correct details or not. If this details is correct, again it goes to a queue and then it is processed to do transaction. It's called beneficiary. If you if you if you have ever done this job, then you might know that you add a beneficiary which is then processed to under queue, which checks the sender and receiver. For such kind of transaction, I uh, see SQS can be used. Another example, as we discussed in the e-commerce site, Amazon.com is also using the SQS system to order to to process your orders so whenever there is a sale they enable this sqs and every transaction happening is goes to under this sqs the person who is successfully got entered into this queuing system will get the product and they will get a particular uh, session of time to process the order with your banking details and all the address details to fulfill 
So for all this application where a process needs to be consumed for a small period of time, at that time this SQS comes into the picture. Okay. Mm -hmm. But for similar cases, even we can have the DB as well, right? DB? Sorry, once again. Sorry? Uh, which software? No, no. D database itself, we can use it, right? It's more of like you want to keep track of the transactions, no? Yeah. The, for, uh, if you want to do all these things into the database, then of course database is uh, useful. But for just processing of your data, if you want to keep, then you can go for a SQS. Because once you do write anything on the database, it will be permanently written unless you delete it manually or you specify the time period. But SQS is like for a temporary storage of your messages until the consumer processes these messages this will be kept into a, a queue system. If you are having any mail system or chat messaging system, then if a message is unreaded, which is still not readed by the recipient, then you can keep it in an SQS again. So there are different kinds of applications. Even you can use this for batch processing. Whatever the batch process where orders are coming, you can put into a single queue and you can then process it based on the location, based on the, the details. For batch processing, SQS can be used. Okay. All right. Any other questions, doubt regarding this? <coughs> okay. So our next service is SCS, simple email service. A simple email service is just a service through which you can send promotional messages, transaction emails, etc. This is an email service. Now, whenever you have a free tier or if you are exceeding your free tier, then also AWS gives you 62,000 emails per month for free. With SES, you can send 62,000 emails per month for free. But to send this email, you need to configure your email here. You need to configure your domain system. Then you need to configure your email, maybe your contact at the red domain.com sales at the red domain.com contact us that at the red domain.com whatever you have that part you need to configure here in SES. So SES is a cloud based email sending service designed to have digital marketers and application developers and marketing notifications and transition emails. So for this kind of purposes, you can use the SES service. And I tell you HDFC bank then uh, ticket now book my show then uh, flipkart these all companies are using this ses to deliver their transitional meals over this ses system any moment whenever you do any kind of transactions maybe a banking transaction whenever you purchase any from an e-commerce site as soon as you do these transactions or the promotional mess meals that you receive are all through this ses system it is reliable, cost-effective service for business of all sizes that use email to keep in contact with their customers. The benefits you get is high deliverability, cost-effective and configurable. How we can achieve this high deliverability is whenever you configure your domain with SES and SES follows a common scenarios, a common protocol through which it guarantees that the message will be delivered to the recipient inbox and it will not go to the spam folder. Like there are multiple many kinds of uh, mail services available. But when you use this mail services to deliver messages to your customers, it usually goes to the spam folder. But with this SES, it guarantees that it not guarantees, but it always makes sure that your message is always delivered into the recipient inbox. And with this, it's cost optimized solution that it gives you first of all 62,000 email per month for free. And if you exit then, then there are different charges, which is also very cost effective solutions to send emails over this SES service. 
and it can be easily configurable as you can easily configure your domain services and as well as your email services you can also easily receive the mails so basically if you have configured an email such as contact us at the red domain.com and if i am sending and i am reverting back to that email so these emails can also be seen on scs so you can send messages as well as you can receive a messages on scs so it's a both directions of email service sender plus receiving so use cases where mostly it is used for transactional messages as soon as you do any kind of transaction book any tickets or buy any product or do any transactions on our banking side you can send a transactional messages you can send marketing communications for marketing purposes for sending notification to the users like if you know there are certain applications certain e-commerce sites whenever you log into this site social sites you get a notified that you have just recently logged in from this device so all this kind of notifications also you can send with scs and then you can also receive incoming emails so someone is responding to your emails that also you can accept on scs so this is scs through which you can configure the incoming and outgoing email service any questions in doubt in this part If I don't want email, uh, I can block in SES. Yes, of course. All these features are available. Basically, again, you need to configure your Hotmail or Outlook account with that. So this mails mails will be sent over these services. So you have complete control on blocking of any recipient. Yeah, okay. All right. And so our next application service is SNS. That is a push notification. So Amazon SNS is a web server that makes it easy to set up, operate, and send notification from the cloud. It provides developers with a high, scalable, flexible, and cost-effective capability to publish messages from an application, which is immediately delivered to their subscriber. So now the difference between SES and SNS is through both of the services you can send email notification. But on SES you need to configure your domain, you need to configure your email. Whereas in SNS you don't need to do any of these things. The difference is here on a SES the mail will be sent from any email ID that you specify contact us at the red email dot whatever the domain dot com support at the red domain dot com whatever it is but from sns whenever you deliver an email the it uses amazon dns server that is no reply at the red aws amazon dot com so the difference is between the dns services then the notification that you will get the another difference is on an ses you can have incoming email if someone replies to your revert to your mail then also you can receive on SES whereas an SNS this is not possible it's, it's the email ID itself says no reply at the red domain.com now SNS is doesn't only support the email service but it supports a lot of other platform with this SNS you can publish a messages to Apple Google Firehose or Windows devices you can also send a notification to via SMS. Now this SMS service is currently eligible in US region only. We are not allowed to have SMS service in India. But you can send email to SQS to HTTP endpoint or to Lambda function. SNS allows you to group multiple recipients using a topic. Now there is another difference between an SES and SNS over sending an email that on SES you can list out all the recipient to whom you want to send a messages there will be a list of people to whom you want to send a messages you can easily send but on SNS you cannot do that the person who subscribed to your notification will only receive the mail 
So in many of this uh, social sites, uh, we see that uh, whenever we create a AWS, uh, whenever we create a social media account, it is already opted for subscription of an email service. So whenever we basically try to, uh, basically you are allowed, you have subscribed to this email service. So whenever they throw a messages mail, you are they, these mails are delivered to your email service. So here a participant needs to subscribe to the topic and then only he will he or she will get a notification now with sns you can send a notification to email to sqs to http endpoint and to lambda function so what can be a use cases of designing or throwing a push notification to this system can you guess anyone what can be a option why we require to send a push notification to this other application services to sqs to http endpoint and to lambda function hello Yeah, any workflow kind of analysis, uh, right? Like yeah. someone has approved, you know, then someone should get a notification, then you know, you you push some sort of a notification to them, you know, after approving or. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Any real time example? Uh, Okay, uh, you take an example of workflow itself, you know, uh, you have multiple hierarchy, like you know, level 1, level 2, level 3. Uh, okay. Then, you know, you want to, uh, the level 2 approval will happen. Then you need to uh, you know, send a notification to the level 1 approval also, like level 2 has been you know, passed through. And, uh, and also for the applicant name, you need to send a more notification that, you know, your uh, level 2 approval is also done. So then if you look at that, uh, there, there's going to be like notification is going to happen at the two uh, levels, right? One, you're sending a notification to the previous level and one notification to the applicant itself. Correct. Yes, you can go with that. So I tell you one scenario. If you remember our whenever message. Do, yeah, please. Whenever we do the banking transaction, we will get the mail. Right. <clears throat> So that mail is like an email service, correct? I guess. What about SQS, HTTP enter or LAMP? <laughs> Any examples uh, on this SQS, HTTP endpoint or LAMBDA function? <laughs> I can just put some uh, uh, triggers in the lambda functions where it can connect to the SNS. And uh, for example, if it reaches some threshold, I can I can uh, send a notification to the uh, to SNS via something like I'm going to send a mail to the SNS once the trigger is happened. Okay, so we need to say if any kind of threshold reaches, if any of the resources reaches to their threshold, then you can send a uh sns notification or email notification right what about the lambda http endpoint or sqs any example on this come again i didn't get you HTTP any examples from lambda functions http endpoint all right i tell you one example if you remember our s3 session then in s3 we have seen an example of a job portal so in this job portal what happens whenever a person uploads a resume as soon as the resume is uploaded successfully you get a message that resume uploaded or in any of the application on any browser if you upload any kind of document as soon as the document is uploaded you get a small notification uh, just in the red mark or anywhere that document is uploaded successfully. Karen, have you ever seen that messages? Yes. yes. So these kind of messages is called as HTTP points, endpoints. It, it, 
this kind of messages you can send at http or https endpoint that can be configured in such a way that as soon as an resume is uploaded into an s3 bucket that is put object has been created so once the put object is created you can send an http notification saying that the resume has been successfully uploaded right so this kind yes. of notification that is resume uploaded or uh, have done uh, whatever this kind of http http notification you get you can get it by now sqs and lambda function is like let's say we have written a lambda function that processes this resume it extracts the information from the resume it reads a file of your resume pdf for document file whatever you have it reads a file and it extracts the information so if you have created such kind of lambda function then you can also invoke a lambda function from an sns so what will happen sns will trigger to http endpoint saying that this uh, request has been successfully uploaded and then it will also process the lambda function that uh, to extract the information for the resume it invokes the lambda function lambda function will extract the data and then it will write to the dynamo db whatever kind of scenarios you have you can use this sns to deliver the content and to extract the information with this different application services over a different platform the benefits of uh, sns is it is push based delivery again always remember this is a push based delivery it contains simple api and easy integration with other application you can integrate sns with all other applications it has a flexible message delivery over multiple transport protocols as we have already seen you can send a messages to sqs sns uh, sorry http https endpoint to lambda function sms email etc it is inexpensive and with pay as you go model with no upfronts you don't need to pay anything charge uh, based on your usage yes uh, that is uh, <coughs> something like it, uh, other than this sns notification where uh, uh, where it's going to connect to the some uh, mailing email and sms okay uh, will it provide any other third party uh, uh, connectivity like for example uh, like uh, iftt is going to provide the services for uh, connecting to the facebook messenger and whatsapp messenger and uh, like google assistant something like that do we have any uh, something like these services in aws which can support a third party uh, connectivity no there is no direct service available that can connect to your third party but what you can do is with either you can go with ec2 machine to have this kind of communication or you can go with lambda now we have worked on a project uh, that basically is like a uh, medical uh, solution that whenever a system is uploaded whenever an emr or x ray is done this documents are uploaded on the s3 bucket so now we want a system that can send us notification to the whatsapp to the different doctors so the way that we have process is like once the document has been uploaded to the s3 bucket s3 bucket will get an sns notification to the lambda function so lambda function now what it does it if we have created an api if we use the whatsapp api we have integrated uh, whatsapp in our lambda function and then through this lambda function we used to trigger the whatsapp notification to different doctors so in this way you can generate this query yes uh, the same thing we work with uh, some http endpoints with uh, alexa devices okay since yeah. uh, alexa doesn't supports with other platform but with the http endpoint uh, we integrated with the uh, azure okay uh, is the same way we are going to do uh, for other services also if you want to integrate with third party services yes yes because actually for the third party services you need to again you, uh, you have to first subscribe or you need to uh, you know have a access key and secret key so that kind of credentials is not possible in providing the aws services <laughs> So for that you must have either an EC2 machine to process data or a Lambda. Okay. All right.
these are the different pricing models. Now this pricing model changes from region to region. And usually the pricing model will be almost same. There will be slightly change in the pricing model from different regions. So these are our application services and uh, so where we see in the S3 how we can use the SNS service. All right, so this is my SNS dashboard and uh, I'm in Mumbai. But the bucket that we have created ISL global is in Singapore region. Okay. So in my SNS section, I will go to the Singapore. All right. So the first step is to create a topic. You need to always create a topic. A topic is nothing but define the purpose of sending an email. Like if you have a transaction email is you have a marketing emails then you can separate these two emails with this topic. Let's call it event topic. Right, I have just given a display name that alert event occur in S3. Do you need to encrypt the system? Do you want to grant any access policy? Like here I say everyone that everyone can publish a messages to the topic and everyone and anyone can subscribe to this topic. So I have kept the open. Then do you want to set the delivery to track? If delivery to the HTTP, HTTPS endpoint fails, then how many retries do you want to do? And what should be the delay in between two retries that you can configure here? If you want to preserve the all the uh, log system, where whenever the SNS is sent the messages, if you want to save the logs, you can provide it here. And tags, these are again, all the, everything is optional. So we'll not go with any of these things. We'll just click on create topic. The display name must be maximum a date. So, even yeah, Malik, this is the uh, the subject name uh, which is going to be appeared in the email, right? The display name. Yes, again with the same email. Maximum hundred characters in I think this is not allowed. Okay, so our topic is created with the event topic name and uh, display name is alert event in S3. Now you cannot directly publish an email or SMS to this endpoint. You must have first subscription to before you send an email. So I click on create a subscription and who from which protocol on which protocol you want to send a notification to this person. So these are the different endpoints HTTP, HTTPS point, email, SQS, Lambda, platform application endpoint, which is the Android, iOS that you can send. SMS is already now supposed in Singapore also. So you can go with this. If you're having a Singapore based transaction, then you can go for this. And then I click on create subscription. Now, subscription is created, but the person is to need accept or confirm the subscription. As you can see here, I got a notification alert event in S3. Can you see this? Alert event in S3, and the email ID is no reply at the rate snsamazon.com. So it says you are chosen to subscribe to this topic. This is the ARN. If you want to subscribe, then click on confirm subscription. And here it says the subscription is confirmed. 
now if i just refresh this sns part once again event topic and it says this subscription is confirmed now whatever messages you want to do you can just click on push messages give a name and click on publish messages now when i click on publish message i must receive a mail okay, you can see hi alerts s3 put event occurred so in this way you can send messages emails to different subscription at the same time you can have a list of a uh, big list of subscriptions that must be accepted confirm before you send a notification now if you remember in our uh, st part we have left the event part that is event properties so let's just create one event alert on put object let's click on event type is put prefix we don't want to give any prefix to the entire bucket Surface if you want to have on a specific type of file, maybe a JPG file, document file, PDF file, then you can select that. And then I will choose the notification to the SNS topic. So the one that we have just created, event topic, I choose that and click on save. Now SNS V2, and if I try to upload any document here, we must receive an email so the first email is that you are services amazon st event is test event so this is basically a test event once you do this kind of hosting once you do this confirmation this kind of event is occurred but from now onwards whenever you upload a file Okay, not keep them is uploaded. Now it should automatically hit a email. And here we have. Now what is this email? Copy. Now try to understand this exam. This uh, record set. It says there is a record, there is an event version, event source is Amazon S3. Then there is a AWS region from which region the event has been triggered, the time when it was triggered, event name, object created, put object has been created, user identity, who has uploaded this document, this access key ID. So every user will have their own access key and secret key. So this is the access key of this user. The principal is this person. Now the request parameters are source IP for my public IP. This is my public IP from which the upload photo is uploaded. The file is have been uploaded. And these are the some request IDs that is the metadata of that image. Now from this point onwards, this is the metadata of that file. S3 schema version is 1.0 that is the first version configuration ID is alert put put event is occurred bucket bucket details now that is the name of the bucket is icel training global dot org dot training day 3 owner is again of this bucket is same as the requester the ARN of this bucket is this the object is not key dot pm file the size of this file is 
1696KB. The e tag which is applied on this file is this version ID and the sequencer. So these all metadata you get whenever you hit a put notification on an S3. So can we sort this record? Can we sort this metadata? Of course, let's say you are running a production infrastructure and to your production infrastructure, if anything happens to your S3 bucket, if any kind of data is uploaded, let's talk about again the example of a job portal. So as soon as the job a resume is uploaded, you are sending an email notification to the end user as well as to the different HR managers. So if you are sending such kind of email notification to these people, will they accept this email? Is it even a readable format? Then Yes, guys. Can we send such kind of emails yeah. to our? No, 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 no. I think uh, since it is a JSON format, like uh, it's, it's like you can read it. So, so what we can do for, to make it more interactive and or to make it more presentative? If I tell you I need to send this kind of email notification to the HR managers and to the end system user who has uploaded this uh, file, uh, send them email notification. How we can process this with this kind of information? In HTML, we'll show this data. So you will import this data in an HTML and then you will send it via SES. Sorry, didn't get you. So now let's make it more simple. When you are sending an email to your end person or to the HR manager, what information will you send? Let's say I have uploaded a resume to your application. You are running a job portal and I am your customers. I have uploaded a resume on your job portal. So what resume, uh, what information, what acknowledgement I expect from your side? And what is your expectation to send to acknowledgement? Resume uploaded successfully. No, current CTC. Experience current CTC, expected CTC. Like Key points. Key points. Yeah. Okay. Of course, the key point uh, is a different part. That is, you need to extract the information from the resume, and then you will process that information. Yeah, outcome but the, will be successful. The question here is, like, as soon as I upload a video, uh, sorry, as soon as I upload a video, how I will get a confirmation that uh, my resume has been successfully uploaded? I need an acknowledgement. I need acknowledgement via email that my resume has been successfully uploaded. Now, of course, if I am not a tech person, I am not. I don't know JSON. Then this is uh, use useless data. Can we pass this information in our Lambda function? Yes. Yes. Now try to understand this scenario. If I pass this information, this metadata to the Lambda function, and if I start this information in the Lambda function, write a simple Python library, if I use a simple Python language, and sort this data to the data which I actually require to send, Maybe the object name that is here, the name of the file, the size of the file, and the IP address of the source from where the IP address has been. Uh, this uh, user has uploaded the file and the time. 
because all this information is already required from this information that as soon as I upload a resume on my application, this is the acknowledgement that I must get. I don't care, care about what is the bucket ID, what is the bucket, in which region this bucket is created. I really don't care about it. So I can sort this data, I can just sort this data to the four different information that I require. And I can push a message again to Anna via SCS or SNS to the end user. As the person has created an account on my job portal site, I can ask him to subscribe for the notification. And this is really very useful. And uh, this is a very common. Whenever you create an account, you are asked to verify your email ID. Correct? Yes, guys. Whenever you create an yes, AWS, or whenever you create any account, you are also you are always requested to verify your email ID. And whenever you click on uh, yes, verify email ID, you are basically opted for the subscription. That's very common scenario. So if a user has already subscribed to my notification. I can process this data into a Lambda function and from Lambda function, I can again process an SNS to send a messages uh, mailed to that end user. Really, it's very simple, right? And Lalit, uh, this SNS service, only that user has to confirm the uh, mail, right? But to, if, if, you want, if he wants to access the notification. Yes, the person is to subscribe to this email service. Okay. Uh, uh, what if... Uh, Otherwise, we can go with the SQS, right? SCS. SCS, sorry, SCS, yeah. Right. Otherwise, you can go with SCS. Okay, okay. yeah, sure. All right. So, in this way, you can process the data and then you can send a custom email notification to the end user. So, this is S3 event as well as the SNS notification. Any question, any doubt in this part? SNS application services. No. All right. So now comes our second service called as CloudWatch. Now CloudWatch is a monitoring service. In EC2 instance, while once we have created this EC2 instance, we have seen that uh, there is a monitoring service always available. In this monitoring service, we can see how many utilization you can make on a system, how much uh, this rate in out, everything we can see on that page. So basically, cloud service, CloudWatch is a service which is running behind all the services to capture the data and give you more information about it. Like here, you can see I have one uh, S3 event, S3 option already configured. That these are the different my S3 bucket. Now, based on this data, what are the transactions happening? How many bucket size average is happening? It's showing that data. So here you can configure a dashboard and based on your resources, you can process your data. Like there is a production server, there is a production infrastructure. So on this production infrastructure, you can create a dashboard and you can add all the resources that you are running under this production information. Maybe seven EC2 machine, two S3 bucket, four SNS services, one Lambda function, and uh, two RDS machine. Whatever you have, you can combine it all together and see in a single dashboard. CloudWatch basically gives you two properties or two, what do you say, packages. One can become as a free tier and one that comes with a paid one. A free service gives you a log delivery in every five minutes. Whenever this kind of event is occurred, after five minutes, you will get a notification about that. And when you, which is basically completely free, which has already been, uh, whatever the cost of that uh, five minutes delivery, which is already included in your resources. But when you go off for one minute of delivery report, at that time, it costs you extra. This day is extra charges for that when you opt for one minute of delivery. So here is we have a dashboard and in this dashboard you can create a dashboard. Give a name. Let's say this is my production. ENV. So what kind of dashboard you want? 
uh, line bar, a stack area, number, text area, query result, etc. Let's go with stack area, configure. And what kind of stacks you want, what kind of resources that you want to create here. Now, one important point here, this is in Singapore region, whatever we do in the Singapore region. So what are the resources which is currently available in the Singapore? Only you can find it there. So we have S3, we have SNS, that's why it's showing us two uh, different services here. So if I click on S3, there are storage matrices available to our bucket. That is the amount of storage happen. If I click on one week, then you can see the amount of data which is uploaded on this date on 15th of August 20, 2019. This number of storage, the bucket size was 7.91 MB and the number of objects were 1.34. And from by the time till today, the amount is 9.15 MB total size of my bucket and the number of objects are 2.89 thousand objects. So here there are two types of matrix available. One that matches the number of objects and then second is a bucket size bucket. These are the two matrix available for the S3. Now in case if you are looking for a different kind of object, different kind of metric, then you can create your own custom matrix that will utilize the AWS resources and create a resources for you. So currently by default, these two kinds of buckets, two kinds of uh, matrix system is available. And you can choose the range of period. Let's say three months. And you can see the bucket was created on this day and from this day till this, we have this kind of information available. weeks two weeks more bucket is off so i click on create a widget let's call it as my production bucket prod bucket one so on my prod bucket just give me a second So on my prod bucket, this is the storage type. And uh, if I change the custom to the four weeks, then I can see here the data. Or even if I go for a one, one week, and I will be still able to see the data. This is about the S3. If you have more AWS services, then you can configure here. Like an SNS, total matrix, there are four event matrix, that is number of messages published by this SNS by this particular sns topic how many messages has been published size of the message number of notification delivered and the number of notification failed so let's say i want to have only um, how many size the size of the message published so as of now here you can see there is a small data that is 348 around something because the message is just now created, so there will be a less amount of data. Here you can see number of messages published one and the publish size is 348. So or we can go with this as a number bar. So it will take few time as we have just created the system. So after the some time we can see here that information about the number of messages published, the size of the, each of these messages and the number of messages published by the time. So this is your dashboard. You can click on save dashboard. And similarly, you can see multiple resources based on the production environment. Maybe your 10 different EC2 machine, load balancer, upscaling, everything. All right, this is your dashboard. Any question in this part, dashboard? Uh, Lamit, uh, can, can we send the notification to the CloudWatch? Can we integrate the SNS with the CloudWatch? CloudWatch is already integrated with SNS service. So 
so you can create an alarm as we are now looking to this alarm so with this yeah. alarm if it reaches to that threshold it will automatically send the notification to the subscriber if you are the subscriber then you will get a notification okay oh, it is integrated only with sns yes or, uh, cloud already integrated with sns only with sns simple notification service no it's only with sns or other services also no no it's basically integrated with all the aws services but oh. here the thing is it captures the data from all the different aws services and then push the notification via sns okay. like that alarm part, that alarm part uh, that services here it is using is only sns right no no, no. For example, you have 10 EC2 machine which is running out of their uti uh, utilization. Let's say they have reached to the 90% of utilization. All right. So, AWS CloudWatch will detect this uh, notification, which it will detect the logs, and if it reaches to that threshold, then it will send a notification via SNS. So, all the AWS services which you have configured to meet that particular threshold, if it goes to that limit, then SNS. Uh, CloudWatch uses SNS to deliver a message to you. Okay. Yeah. So in between two AWS services, there is a middle service called as CloudWatch. CloudWatch from the right, left hand side, it will take the resources from the AWS, and it will take the logs from the AWS services, and then it will deliver the content via SNS. Sorry. Okay. And. Uh, uh... Other than the uh, AWS services, will it support any other uh, services? Will the CloudWatch support any other uh, services other than AWS? No, no. Like if you have created, uh, like say, Apache Apache server on your EC2 machine. Now, if this Apache server logs you want to see on your CloudWatch, then you can do that. You can indicate CloudWatch agent in your EC2 machine that will take a logs and deliver it to CloudWatch. In that way, you can configure the third-party application to have communication with CloudWatch. Mm -hmm. is, it, is CloudWatch is a paid service? Yes, CloudWatch is a paid service. Thank you so very much. Mm -hmm. So there is a Yeah, so there is an agent available, CloudWatch agent, that you can install on your EC2 machine, and you can specify where to collect the metrics, where to collect the logs. So at that time, you can give the source input as the Apache log. It will take an Apache log and deliver it to the CloudWatch services. And on this CloudWatch, you can monitor your services. So in case if there is anything goes wrong in your Apache server or your Apache server fails to perform the services. Then you will get a notification. Okay. Can we deploy this? Can we deploy this CloudWatch agent uh, in the devices, uh, micro or microcomputers? Um, not. You cannot. You can integrate in only in different AWS resources. Okay. All the services which is integrated on the AWS, on that part only you can do this as uh, CloudWatch services. Okay. Now you can create an alarm uh, for this unit to select a matrix. Let's say the matrix like storage matrix, uh, the bucket size of data. Let's select this bucket. And if you see the custom data with the two weeks back, the data is now reached to 9.15. Just give me a second, guys.
Hello, sorry. So currently you can see the reach to the 9.15 MB. So if I set an alarm at the 9 MB, then it will give us a email. Or let me just do one thing. Let me just create an alarm at 10 MB. So I select this metric. And you can see this, it has reached to 9.15 MB. Bucket size, standard storage, name of the bucket, average, create one. So if a static data goes greater than 10 MB, Or one zero two four. Greater than ten. So let me just configure at the 5 MB and data points to one out of one. They are transmitting. Next, let's just see once again where you want to send the data. I want to send the data to an existing topic. So, event topic, I select here event topic, the one that we have just created, and say click on next. Alarm name. S3 out of service. Let's say next. And click on create alarm. So now this data range has been passed to nine point. 15 MB and our database uh, bucket size in bytes. So in bytes uh, We need to convert the bytes into MBs So view in matrix again, we need to edit this part. And here we need to specify this number. And you can see here, this number is set to this location. So once your endpoint reaches to this threshold now, it will deliver a message to you. I think this is a little high. That's perfect. So once it reaches to 10 MB, it will deliver a message to you. All right. So in this way, you can configure an alarm. This is 7 MB. Uh, 
or let's say 10 MB. All right, now it is set to the 10 MB. Click on update alarm. And now as soon as we upload a document that reaches to the 10 MB, we must get an email notification. Let's try. Upload. Hmm. Which is like uh, not sufficient. Let me just download 3 MB file. Upload. Download and Three MB file. Upload. Now this file, three MB file, has been uploaded. Now our size has been increase of our bucket. So we need to wait for the time till it detects that the, it has reached above the. 10 MB. Hello, guys, are you getting this part? Yes, yes, I am. Okay, I thought you, uh, you went sleeping. No. As we have set the time to five minutes, so we need to wait here. We have metrics. Let's say one minute. Let's see if it retries into one minute or something. Three minutes, five minutes, auto refresh in ten seconds. All right, did you get this part? Basically, this is like uh, to get an email notification only. You will get a, we'll see how to get an email. So as soon as it uh, sees that the time is, it will send us an email. So we can now move ahead to our next service called as CloudTrail. Okay, okay. Lalit, I have a question. One minute, Lalit. Yes, yes. One minute, one question. Uh, Lalita, see, um, um, before we are going to subscribe to the cloud watch yes cloud lesson you don't need to log, subscribe to the cloud watch you need to subscribe to sns no no i'm just asking the different question here okay uh see uh if i'm not uh, 
I'm going to subscribe the CloudWatch uh, once the service is deployed. For example, I have Lambda three uh, Lambda services, yes, uh, uh, S three bucket services. I already am using that. And uh, if, if I use, if I use, start using the CloudWatch, I'm able to access the matrix of uh, the previous uh, uh, period period of time. Um, sorry, I didn't get your entire thing. So you have Lambda function and S3 buckets already available. Now you okay. want to send notification, right? I, I want I want to collect the matrices uh, from even the uh, past history uh, uh, matrices, which is uh, logs which has happened in these two services. Sorry, pardon. Your voice is breaking a little bit. Oh. Can I able to access the uh, logs, histor history, historical logs of uh, uh, all the services which is already deployed in the cloud origin? Yeah, you can. So there is a time period. Uh, after this time period, maybe 14 days. After that 14 days, you won't be able to retrieve the time period. If you want to retrieve that, then you need to store on a S3 bucket. <coughs> you first push oh. the messages to the S3, and then you will be able to find this historical data. Which means that the retention period for this uh, logs is 40 days in the cloud version. Yes, you can specify different uh, retention periods. There are a lot of retention periods available. I can show you. Uh, there is a logs, and the logs you can create an action, create a log group. So this log group is set to never expire. So at that time you can specify that prayer. What is your retention prayer? So if I if, if you want to have a retention period of 30 days, you can specify the retention period. After the recent reduction period is completed, the logs will be deleted. Okay. So here after 30 days, the logs will be deleted. So technically, whenever you are integrating the AWS services with the CloudWatch, this comes with a default period of 14 days to 30 days. So you can increase either the size of that part or you can store this logs into S3. See, uh, have of historical information. Even I'm able to access the uh, all the service logs. Uh, 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 one minute. Okay, I, can, I can access the, uh, the logs of all the services in the CloudWatch, uh, like historical logs. Uh, once the CloudWatch is created, yes, is it accessible? So what you need to do is, you need to follow a separate procedure. You need to do what? You need to deliver all your logs on S3, correct? Once this logs is been delivered to the S3, now you can process this S3 logs to the CloudWatch. So you will also have a logs as well as you can real time visualize this logs on which you can do processing. And you can, whenever you want to process this historical data, you can also do that. You can also do alarm futures and all these few things. Now you can okay. separate logs from VPC logs, S3 logs, and other Lambda logs with this Lambda function. You can write a Lambda function that will separate all these different logs in an S3 bucket, and that will pull the messages that will pull these logs into a CloudWatch. This is the uh, some kind of flow logs that you need to follow to design such kind of infrastructure. Okay, then uh, I cannot access this historical logs uh, uh, the cloud watch, right? Uh, other than S3 bucket. Yeah, you need to store it somewhere. Okay. okay. If it is more than 14 days. Hello. All right. So that is our cloud watch service. Now we'll see the cloud trail. Now cloud trail is one of the AWS best practices that you need to always follow. Cloud trail is something that it protects your environment. It, it protects your AWS account account from being initiated. Whatever the request you do, whatever the services that you access, it keeps a track of all the services. Now as you can see here, just now what I have done at where on this date at 2:30 p.m., as a root user, I have subscribed to a SNS topic at 2:35:54 p.m. 
I have put a bucket notification. I have put a created a dashboard. Then I have created a bucket notification and then I have created a dashboard. So all this job I have done. So what is cloud trail cloud trail is basically tracks all the users APIs what they have made every single action that you take clicking on the uh, dashboard creating a dashboard or creating an EC2 machine stopping an EC2 machine restarting an EC2 machine all these actions are basically an API calls so AWS cloud trail maintains and tracks all these APIs whatever the things you do all your team members will do it will take a list of all these APIs so here we there will be username now this is a root user that's why it shows my name but in case whatever the user is accessing my data I can see here all the information about that from here I can also see the historical data and everything Again, you know, the way that the thing that I was talking about previously is storing the data on S3 and then you will be able to find this log. The same thing works here. All these logs are delivered into a S3 bucket. And if you store these logs into a CloudWatch, then the default limitation period is 90 days. You can specify the range here and you will get the logs. Now, most of this, this is my logs which is created by me all are having a root users. So what are the things that I have done at what time and when all the things you can see here. Now why AWS cloud trail is considered one of the best practices is so that at the initial level you will have complete information who are accessing your services. Now one of your team members is deleted any server or uh, or misconfigured your server anything it has done then you can easily pick a particular person who has who has done this kind of crime you can easily point out all this person who has done this misconfiguration and deleted that ec2 machine so this cloud trail will help you to track of all the eps made in your aws account now again there are two types of cloud trails available one that you can do on a single region and one that can be done on a multiple regions. Oh, just a minute. So that is, I create a new trail, given trail demo. Now here is the option, apply trails to all regions or to a single region. So currently I'm in Mumbai. If I create trail, then it will be work on a single region. But as the AWS best practices is said, you should create a tail in all the regions. Apply trails to all my organization. That is if you have multiple AWS accounts and if you want to configure this multiple AWS accounts together and you can do this organization level also. Now, what kind of events do you want to register? Read and write events, read only events, write only events or none. Whatever this kind of objects you want to deliver that you can do. Data events, you can record S3 object level activity whatever you used to do at the object level version uh, futures buckets and etc or on the lambdas that it takes a record of all the invokes made by the api you can do on this part or what you can do is you can define the storage location where you want to distribute or where you want to deliver this logs so for this you need to create a s3 bucket if you already have a bucket, then you can specify no and select the name of your bucket. Let's say I said global training and then click on create. So now the logs will be delivered on your bucket. So this is cloud track. Cloud tells what it does it basically tracks all the APIs made to this AWS account by different AWS users. So when you are a solution architect of your organization before you start working on your VPC once you start before you start working on your infrastructure design the first step should be always to create this cloud trail. Okay. Any question any doubt in this part cloud trail service. Uh, Lalit, in this, uh, anywhere we can pull out the uh, report like uh, trend report or anything, 
any reporting is possible. I have seen this in the management part that you can create an inventory report. Whatever happened to your AWS, you can create a report out of that. Also, you can create a dashboard, and from the dashboard, you can create a report using this CloudWatch and this CloudTrail service. <coughs> so you can see here, there is a folder was created, AWS logs, and inside that, this is my account ID. This is CloudTrail service. In which region? In AP Southeast one, 2019, eight month date, today's date, and what are the logs generated? It will deliver here. So this is the path entirely followed by this system. Let me know if you have any questions and doubt in this part. Yeah, continue. All right. So now our next service is Lambda and Cloud Formation. Shall we take a 15 minutes break? Then we can continue again. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. All right. Let's take a 15 minute base and we'll see at exactly 10 uh, 3 30.
So now the service that we are talking about is the cloud formation. Basically, this is called as the infrastructure as a code. What are the services that you have created? The EC2 machine, S3 bucket, SNS, SES, all the services you can create with this cloud formation. So here comes our question that is, when you have everything that you can do on AWS console to create a services, to configure the services, why you will require a infrastructure as a code to design your infrastructure? Can anybody tell me this reason why we require infrastructure as a code to design our infrastructure? What are the benefits that you will get with designing an infrastructure as a code rather than going on AWS console? Yeah, when when it when it comes to the last deployment, um, uh, I think it's it's better to go with the cloud formation. Why? Like uh, when it comes to the large services deployment, I am going to use the multiple services, and if I want to uh, uh, go with the GUI, then it's very tedious process, and also it's time consuming, uh, so that I can make uh, use of these services uh, to automate. Basically, I would say you, the amount of time it takes to create an EC2 machine from a console. It takes twice or thrice the time to write a code, infrastructure as a code, to design that EC2 machine. So with this cloud formation, of course, you will not save your time. You need to spend but extra I'm, time designing this infrastructure. I'm, I'm talking about, uh, I'm talking not only one services, the multiple services I'm talking about. Yeah, so let's understand, let's assume that you have multiple services. There are lots of uh, EC2 machines, then you have ST bucket and SNS, SQS, a lot of services are available. Now, when you have all the services and you are going for a cloud formation, how is going to help you? In what uh, terms? I think we no need to buy the licensing. Yeah. What kind of licensing? For example, database is there. If you are using the database server as a platform. No, no, no. At that time also, you will require a license. You are just creating a resources using the infrastructure. So definitely license will be required. Okay. okay. So when we are using as a platform, so AWS uh, database is there. What is that? Okay. First one. AWS database. Aurora. Aurora. So for that one also we have to buy license. No, that is charged yeah. by AWS only. Aurora, you don't require to buy any license on Aurora. Okay. That will be charged based on usage. Oh, yeah, that is a platform, huh? Based on the usage we are using. Yes. So then what is the use of designing the giant infrastructure with this cloud formation? See, it is like it's an a... orchestrator, uh, Lalit. It's, a, it's a something like uh, spend uh, spend more time in developing the uh, uh, use cases or applications and spend less time in the infrastructure. Hello? Hello? No, no, no. Yes, yes. Yeah. Lalit, this is like an orchestrator. You see, uh, you design the template and anything. So for a future use also, it will be easy for you to, you know, create any kind of infrastructure. Exactly. Yeah. So let's say today you have designed this infrastructure, and again, let's say due to any reasons you want to replicate the infrastructure in future. If you consider the example of Uber, Uber was first created in US, and then now it is created in it, the service is now available in multiple countries. Now, definitely, a single infrastructure will not sufficient to millions of users. So they design the infrastructure in all their regions. If Uber is in India, they also have infrastructure in India. So instead of creating again and again same infrastructure, they create a uh, infrastructure as a code and they replicate the entire infrastructure within minutes. So even they decide to in, uh, to design an infrastructure in let's say there is no survey infrastructure available in Mumbai. 
and they wish to design their infrastructure in Mumbai. So within only a few minutes, they can set up the entire infrastructure. So for the replication purposes, this is very important. Secondly, when you are having uh, multiple resources that you want to create, like multiple EC2 machines versus multiple SC bucket, then instead of creating multiple resources, you can copy the content and you can replicate the code. If I want to create 10 different EC2 machine, I can copy the code of a single EC2 machine and copy and paste it 10 times. So the 10 EC2 machine will be created. So this makes a job easy as well as useful for future purposes. It also helps you to reuse the code. A simple piece of code can be reused again and again, which is again a best practice of software development lifecycle. What if one of the infrastructure is completed down on the AWS data center? The entire AWS data center is down. So in that case, if the entire data center is down and you have created the infrastructure with the infrastructure as a core, then you can replicate the same infrastructure and again bring your entire data and every application in another region within only a few minutes. So these are the advantages of having a cloud formation and 99.99% of all the AWS customer uses cloud formation to design their infrastructure. From a very small infrastructure to a very giant infrastructure, everyone uses this cloud formation for automation purposes. So AWS cloud formation is a so easy way to create and manage a collected a collection of AWS services which allow orderly and predictable provisioning and updating of resources. It allows you to version control. So the best part is you can have version controlling. Let's say you have a version version one that creates two EC2 machine and one SC bucket. Now you create a version two that will create four EC2 machine and two SC buckets. So in any moment, if you want to shift back to the first version, you can have that option. You can update the existing stack and you can edit the existing stack that also possible and apart from this you only pay for the resources that you create so if you are creating an ec2 machine if you are creating any s3 bucket then whatever the charges will be that you need to pay for creation via this cloud formation is absolutely free you need to, you don't need to pay anything to the cloud formation you just need to pay for the resources that you will create So how it works basically you write a code that code you upload to the ST bucket or you save it locally then you pass this code to the cloud formation and cloud formation will check the file it checks the JSON format it checks the validation it does all the things and if your template is valid then it will create a stack for you this is a format of writing a template this is a JSON format it starts with the curly basis and the first statement is AWS template format version. This is mandatory to include and the version is 2010.99. Now this is a not, not a date. This is not a date when the slide was created. This is a version name. You need to also follow the same version. If you miss and provided your own current date, then you will not be able to create any stack. And best part is you don't need to even remember this version number. On the AWS cloud formation template, uh, AWS console, you will find this version ID. No need to learn this part. So this is the mandatory one. Then we have a description, which is an optional thing. If you want to describe about what template you are creating for what purpose, you can describe that. You have parameter section, mapping section, resource section, output section. These are also conditions, metadata. There are a lot of services, a lot of components available. We'll see one by one. There are components of cloud formation, parameters, mapping, condition, resource, output. Now, among the five different components, only the resource parameter, the resource component is mandatory you must always have a resource section in your cloud formation. Rest of the things are optional. If you want to have, then you can include. Otherwise, it's okay to not have. 
So what is parameter? Parameter is basically an optional section to customize your template during the creation of stack. So let's assume I want to create a VPC. So what are the information required to create a VPC? Yes, guys, what are the things do you require to create a VPC? Hello. Hello. So I want yes, I want to create a VPC. What are the information required to create a VPC? You have to have a public and uh, private IP. Next is uh, a subnet. A subnet. I want to just create a VPC. So for VPC creation, what are the resources? What are the things I need to know? <coughs> yes, guys, we already have discussed this VPC part, right? Yes, yes. So what are the information you require? A name for VPC, then CIDR range and the tenancy, correct? This three information. So now try to understand this part. If I write a code and I hard code all this information, the name of the VPC, the CIDR range, maybe 10, 0, 0, 0, 16 and the tenancy is default. So every time you execute this template, you will find the same resources. Yes, yes. Yes, what I mean to say. You have one VCC with the same name, ABC, EIDR, SF, 10.0.0.0 slash 16. And, and what else? Tenancy. That is default. So if I hard code this part in my cloud formation template, then every time I execute this template, it will ask me the same. It will create the same resources again and again. But what if I ask a user to enter the custom input? Like you have you have work on a programming, you are programmer developers. So you ask user to enter the inputs and based on that inputs you customize the development for example i want to do arithmetic calculation so for doing the arithmetic calculation what we do we ask the user to enter the value for a enter the value for b once you user enter the value for a and b we do arithmetic calculation so in most similarly we ask user to enter the values of abc name cidr and tenancy so that Every time this template will be executed, we will have a customized input. If I want to create two different infrastructure in the same region, then I can use the same template again. So parameters helps us to achieve that. You can write a simple code like this. That is parameters and you can ask instance type parameters. So I'm asking here user to enter the instance type for my EC2 machine. So there are a list of different EC2 instance types available. So out of this different EC2 instance type, which one should a user choose? So the type of the string is string, that is uh, whatever the input of the user, that needs to be string. The default value, like if the user do not select any kind of value, the default should be the T2 micro. What are the values that is allowed? A user can select T2 micro, M1 small or M1 large. These are the only options that it has. And then I provide a description that enter either a T2 micro, MBA small or MBA large. The default will be the T2 micro. So I provide the default information and the values that are allowed. Now there are certain limitations with these parameters. That is in a single template, you are not allowed to have maximum or more than 60 parameters. 
you can ask max up to 60 parameters in a single template each parameter must be given a logical name so in this part this instance type parameter this instance type parameter is a logical name this logical name needs to be always unique in a single template each parameter must be assigned a parameter type that is what kind of uh, user input you are asking a string number or two first kind of value and parameter must be declared and referenced from within the template so whatever the parameter you are asking of course that you need to refer so now understand there is a parameter section and in this parameter you have asked the user to enter the vpc information now first whenever you create a resource whenever you create a vpc at that time you need to pass this information so here i am creating one vpc so in this part i will say name and says ref to the name of the vpc So whatever the user will input the name here, this will be saved in this name variable and this variable will be referred here, which has been attached to your VPC. So you, your VPC will get a name from the name that Abu customized here. Similarly, CID range. Again, you can do the ref and here you can provide this name of the CID or whatever you are asking. So whatever the user will enter the data, it will be stored in this variable. This variable will be referred here. So whenever the resource will be created, the customized resource will be created. All right, are you getting this? Any questions in this parameter part? All right. Now second comes here the mapping part. Now there are certain services which are region specific, correct? Your EC2 is region specific, your VPC is region specific, your S3 is region specific. So if you are trying to create an EC2 machine and if you have given a T2 micro machine with the AMI ID XYZ and this AMI ID is only acceptable in Mumbai region. So can I create the same template? Can I use the same template to create an infrastructure in North Virginia? Is it possible? Yeah, you can create. How? By giving key. By giving key. Uh, no, my question was. I have created a cloud formation tablet which I am creating an EC2 machine. All right. So in this EC2 machine, I have given an AMI ID and instance type. So that piece of code can I execute in another region? Is it possible? Uh, CO ID uh, because that is a private IP, no? And it is region specific. I am uh, no, we are talking about the infrastructure creation. So once this piece of code, if I execute in North Virginia, so the same EC2 machine will be created. So is it possible to create another EC2 machine in another region? Yes, you can create. Will create in another region only, no, for code. So what makes an instance a region specific? Have a look. We are in Mumbai region. Like, just give a minute. We are in Mumbai region. If I click on launch instance, then here the AMI ID is AMI 0D269. All right. Let's check the same AMI in the North Virginia. The AMI is, is same. 
zero six two nine, and here it is O B eight nine eight zero. So if in a EC two machine, if I hard code this part that choose this AMI, can I execute this AMI ID in Mumbai region? Is it possible now? Yes, guys, please. If I hard code this AMI in our cloud formation template, can I use the same template to execute in all the different AWS regions? Is it possible? I think it will not be possible. Of course, this AMI ID changes, so we cannot execute into different region. But we need to make sure that our template is such a design that it can be executed in all the region. Correct. That's what makes the cloud formation template to be reusable. Otherwise, it, it has no purpose. Correct? Yes. So for that, we have a mapping. A mapping is an optional section again that matches the key to its corresponding set of names. So what we can do is, let's say for my production environment, if I always want to go with the Red Hat Linux. All right my application designed with a Red Hat Linux 8 HPM. So what I need to do is I need to just copy this AMI ID and pass in the region. That is, I want to do mapping US East one AMI is AMI ID that particular. Again, I will go to the US West one and I copy the AMI ID and pass it here. So now it doesn't matter in which region you are executing the template. If you are exiting this template in US East one, then this AMI ID will be fetch. If the you are exiting this template in US West one, then this AMI ID will be used. So the AMI will be the same. Whatever changes in the AMI ID, that will automatically map. All right. So in this way, a single template can be executed in multiple regions. The cut component is a condition. A condition is again an optional section that specifies the circumstances under which the entities are created. So while creation of this any EC2 any machine or while creation of any resource, if you want to give any kind of functions, if you want to give any kind of condition, you can use this kind of function and equal if not all. And then we have a require a mandatory section called as resources on which we will actually create a resources. So in this part, we'll create a EC2 machine. We we'll define the type properties, etc. And finally, we have the last component that is output. Now output is the optional section that contains the value which is import to another stack or for your reference. So now if you have a giant infrastructure, a very big infrastructure then you can distribute this entire infrastructure into multiple templates and then using this import export function you can pass the values for example you have created a vpc in template a but you are creating an ec2 machine in template b so these values of vpcs and subnets whatever you require you can pass it to the template 2 via this import export function. So there's two in two, two templates can be called as cross tech template. Any question in doubt in this part? Cloud formation. Yes. Yes. Uh, if I JSON code, we can uh, write in two multiple templates like Python. Yes. Can, uh, when we when we execute it, it will come in same or it will show in different. Yes, it will show in different. Okay. Now 
for creation of the any aws services any aws resources you don't need to remember a single piece of code every code every whatever you require is already available on the aws documentation you just need to google it properly it is aws cloud formation let's say i want to create a vpc so aws cloud formation vpc and this kind of link when you see you just need to click and here is your syntax of creation of a vpc so i just copy this syntax and So here I say uh, my VPC and I have pasted the code. So my type is AWS EC2 VPC. So from this site, Cloud Formation detects that you want to create a VPC, not an EC2 instance. So this type is very important. Then what should be the properties of your VPC? First is let's just create a range. Let me just also this time. And 0, 0, 0, 0, you want to enable DNS hosting? Yes, true. You want to enable this DNS support? Let's say true. Yes, can you see? What are the two different types of tendencies available, guys? Yes, guys, we have just now seen one of the two different types of attendance. Default and dedicated. What is default and what is dedicated? You can just click here on the instance I will see if you do not know what is uh, it gives the information about the tenancy and what are the values that is allowed. Yes, guys. Now, please have a look on this part. We are starting our cloud formation template from here. We define our <laughs> project 2010-99. And the first issue that we are creating is my VPC. The type is AWS to VPC. And the property that we require to create a VPC is Tenancies and just <laughs> 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 <laughs>
हेलो हेलो कैन यू मी हेलो हेलो यू गैस यार हेलो 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 ओके यू कैन कैन कंटिन्यू कंटिन्यू सो हैव डिड यू नो व्हाट वी हैव जस्ट जस्ट वी हैव जस्ट क्रिएटिंग अ स्टैक सो व्हेन आई क्लिक ऑन क्रिएट हियर i can just click on this middle button refresh and this so now it's ch checking out all the re resources that i want to create and it will start creating a vpc right so we need to wait here till the create becomes complete so once the create is complete if i refresh now we must have in north virginia so here the template was created in north virginia so if we check here the mice vpc cf which is 10.00/16 has been created using this cloud formation so in this way you can design your infrastructure with this cloud formation all right okay now this is something that we have hard coded all the credentials and everything what if you want to have a parametric thing so we write here let's say we need to take a cid range of a vpc so what i can do is i can just simply cloud formation parameter and i will just copy the content from here and this is so similarly our pipe will be again string Default will be let's say one ninety two one sixty eight zero dot zero slash sixteen. So if a user doesn't include any kind of CID range, then the default will be considered, and we do not require any allowed values, and we specify the mention enter range for VPC. All right. Now we are asking user to enter the range for CIDR. Now this is something that we need to refer here. So what we'll do? We'll remove this part, open the curly braces, and ref CIDR. 
So what if the users enter the value here will be copied into the CIDR block. So I'll just copy this code once again. Click on design template. Again, I click on template, remove this and replace this part. And we have one VPC. Checking the template. It contains error that is template contains error. Invalid template property or properties parameters. So P A R A M E T E R S parameters. Now the template is valid and we can click on create a new style. Let's see this time demo two. And now this time it is asking us to give the information. Do you want to change the CID range or this should be you required to have a CID range. So let's say 192.18.00 slash 16. I have changed the CID range. Next. Next. And click on create. So here yeah, you can see the new VPC has been creating 192.18.00 slash 16. Again, the name will be the same. My VPC is iPhone CF and this resource is been created. So in this way, you can make your cloud formation completely customizable using the parameter option. There is option to update the stack in case if you want to add more resources, if you want to delete the resources, you can just click on update the stack and you can add and remove the resources. All right. Do you have any questions in doubt in this part? Cloud formation. Hello. Finally, uh, All right. So it looks very easy to create the AWS cloud formation template, but it's not that easy. You need to work on a lot on this JSON format as well as creation of the resources at each layer. So I have one template which I have created uh, previously. This is a template that will create a VPCs and CloudTrail, Internet Gateway, NAT Gateways. What are the things that we do on a AWS console? It has all the things. So we'll just have a look. If you see, it has 16 different resources. Then it has a 16 different parameter that I am asking. We have a mapping, metadata, and output. Now let's see VPC. Our VPCs we are creating here, and we are asking user to enter the input for the VPC. Refer CIDR. Here we are asking user to enter the name. Then here we are asking user to enter the name of a VPC, which we have referred in the tags. So this is completely customized. Whatever the name the user will provide plus the CID range, it will accept. Then here we are creating a role. That role is basically to create a flow log. So we are giving a name as flow log role. And then we are creating a VPC log group. So the next resource that we are creating is a log group. And then we are enabling the flow log. Then we are creating an internet gateway here. And we are asking again user to enter the name and all the details. And then we attach this internet gateway to our VPC. Then we, here we are creating a public subnet. Here this is all required information for a public subnet. The CID range is again asked from the users to input. Also the ability zone. Then we have a custom route table and the default route table that is public route table and the private route table we are asking user to input. Route update that is we are now updating the route table with our internet gateway. The source is 0000 and the gateway ID is internet gateway. 
then we have public subnet association that is we will include our subnets to be a part of that route table so we are doing that association we are here creating a passion subnet and then we are also creating a passion subnet association then we create a security group for our batch and subnet that is 22 port is open to the destination address now we are asking user to enter the destination address if we provide 0000, 000, 000 then the batch and subnet will be accessible then here we are creating a batch and server that is your ec2 instance now the instance type it is again we are asking from the user the security group the batch and security group subnet do you want to have termination protection which emi you want to choose everything we are asking from the user and then last finally we are creating an elastic ip now here we are come to the parameter section we are whatever the things resources that we are asking from the user we have mentioned all this information let me just show you by creation of this resource template validation and then finally we click on create a stack and now there are certain things that you need to look into this picture about designing this template first it is asking us to enter the stack name let's say demo one now in the parameter section we have created multiple groups first group is VPC and in this VPC group, we have defined multiple values that belongs to the VPC. Then we are talking about the public subnet. So we have another created another group. And in this part, we have given this information. Then we are talking about the management subnet for the, for the management subnet. What are the things required? We have defined the things. Then we are asking for the management server details. And here we are asking. So here we have designed our interface as well. Apart from designing the cloud formation template, we are also designing the template here. So here you can define the range of the VPC. Let's say 172, 178, 0 0.0 slash 16. Name of VPC, that is CF template. Now the retention period for your flow logs, the default is 14, we'll keep it that. What kind of accepted, rejected or all traffic that you want to allow? Let's go with all. Now I want to create a public subnet. So in which every zone I want to create a subnet? So there is a list of every zone, US East one. Now do you know from where this list is? Here we can see. If I execute the same template in Mumbai region, I will get a list of the ability zone from Mumbai automatically and dynamically. If I execute the same template in Singapore, I will get a list of all the ability zone in the Singapore region. And if you check the code, I haven't mentioned any kind of ability zone there. So how you can give that information here? Any guesses how you can do all these things dynamically? Similarly in the management subnet. Let me know if you have that answers. What is the name that you want to give to the management subnet? Let's call it passion again. Then we are asking user to enter the name of a server. Let's give the passion name. You want to enable termination protection, and here it says select true if the volume needs to be retained post server deletion. That is, if I select true, then the volume will not be terminated, only the institute machine will be deleted. So it means our server data is still retained. Second is EC2 termination protection. Again, I have given the complete information that is, if you select true then it will require to disable the termination protection that is you cannot delete that ec2 machine you need to first disable this permission then you will be able to do that 
then what kind of instance type you want and i have given here a giant list of all the different ec2 machines which one you want to go and the default is t2 micro what should, do you want to be size of your ec2 machine 8 gp 10 gp whatever the in gps and then list of key pairs that you want to select and what should be the source IP of your batch and security group? Everything now the resources that you want to create. Now just imagine if I if I tell you to create a VPC, this kind of number of subnets, all the networking configuration and creation of a server, how much time you will take? And now based on that information, now how much time you will require to create all these resources? So here it becomes very easy to differentiate and to create a resources again and again. So did you have that in answers? How to get this information US East one dynamically? I think, I think you have to mention in that uh, reference point. Uh, no. When you are giving a uh, writing code, you didn't sell uh, you didn't type uh, you didn't do code for any mm -hmm. zone. No? No, there is no code available or I have not written any code that differentiate from region to region and automatically picks the law yes. all the region. All this. You wrote in uh, Virginia, uh, that's why you are getting US East. That's why the template you wrote in uh, Virginia, that's why you are getting US East. If I write in Mumbai, I'll get in Mumbai zone. Exactly, that's that I know. If I select here North Virginia, then I will get here US East one, but I have received only the and if I wish to move to the Mumbai region, then only I will get only three. How? This six ability zone, this three ability zone, two ability zone, how it dynamically fetches and it shows you. I <coughs> I think in the in that region there are maybe three or four. Of course, right. I know that in North Virginia there are only six ability zone available, and in Mumbai there are three ability zone available. Mm. That part is true, but how dynamically it finds that I am creating a infrastructure in North Virginia, and it has a six ability zone, and it's missing all the six ability zone. How that is possible? Uh, based on the VPC range. Based on the VPC range. How this is related? VPC range and the AWS region. Um, maybe AM ID. So, every zone have their IDs, AM ID. No, no. I have a look. There is a public average zone and there is a direct function available. Amazon EC2 average zone name. So whenever you use this function, it will automatically list the number of average zone present in that particular region. You don't need to separately write each of this region. Or you don't need to separately write the all the average zone. If you use this function, it will automatically drop down you the number of RP zones available in that region. So if you, he is not putting any input, he is only mentioning the availability so how it will work, what zones is to find. Yes. For the function, there is no input now. How it will find? It gives a drop down list to you. Sorry, I didn't. 
that is availability zone. Yes. For the function, we are not giving any input. Means how to find out the availability zones? Yes, exactly. Now that's what cloud formation is supporting you. You are asking that parameter in the parameter section. That is, you are asking the input term. So in this okay. section, you are asking user to enter the ability zone, and you get one list of ability zones there. So whatever the ability zone that you select there, it will be in the public AG. Okay. So for this JSON language, it must require. So now, as you can see, the demo is created. Now, if you visit to our VPC, then here you can see the name here VPC, and the CID range is 172. 172. Then you just have a VPC flow log. Flow log is also created. We must have two, three different subnets. And based on the VPC by sort, then here are, we have two different subnets, a management subnet and a public subnet. Then we must have two different route tables. Again, I will sort based on the CF. So here is our public route table and private route table. In our private public route table, we must have an internet gateway, which is automatically created to match, and also the subnets. Correct. We got one internet gateway here, CF internet gateway. We also have an elastic IP. And if I go and see the EC2 machine, we must also have an EC2 machine. Fashion server with an elastic IP attached. So is it easy Lalit, or Yes. Lalit, what is the correct answer for this? It didn't give an answer. Sorry, where? Uh, that availability zone, it came automatic now. Uh, this availability zone came automatically. Yes. Sorry, sorry I didn't get your question. Okay. How is binding availability zone? Because of this function, AWS EC2 every zone name. Okay. Whenever you pass this function, it detects the region and it will automatically fetch the availability zone. Let me just show you again. So I copy this code, I go to the cloud formation. I click on design template. And I paste this code here. Create a stack. Now here you can see it has checked the North Virginia region. And what are the different abilities on present in this ability uh, region? It will list you all the things. Now if you do the same thing in the Mumbai region. Then it will list of all the LD zone in Mumbai. You don't need to hard code any part. It will be dynamically fetch. If you saw one A, one B. If the same thing you want to build in, let's say Middle East, the newest region. Okay, oh, it's not available, I think. Let's do it on Sydney. So, I think Sydney has two or three different abilities on. Now, based on the Sydney region, it will give a list of all the our zone AP Southeast way to C. 
that but the number of clickers and it will list you here that's why this cloud formation seems very easy that you write a code and the resource will be created but even if you try for a creation of vpc you will get it how easy it is just try for a minute let me know if you require any more information about this cloud formation or do you have any questions query now here you can see uh, this is the output section and this output section i want to output a elastic ip which i need to import into a security group <coughs> now understand my query there is one elastic ip maybe 13 12.1 all right this is the elastic ip which i got automatically when i requested for the elastic ip now there is a security group and on this security group i want to associate this elastic ip how to do that in a json language how we can achieve this to copy this elastic ip and paste it here reference okay so if you pass this reference here then this ip address will be copied here but in a security group is this a way of uh inputting the value because in the security if you are having a single ip then you need to add 32 if there is a range of ip then you need to specify the range that is slash 24 slash 16 slash 32 so this is the so if the ip is going to be a part of the security group then you need to define the slash 32 so how will you do this kind of configuration Can we pass on uh, uh, map reference slash 32 or something? Uh, yeah, that was we need to, but how? What is the way in the JSON that through which you can achieve? If I refer this elastic IP, then the entire range will be here referred. The elastic IP 12, 156, 23, 45. This part will be referred, but I need slash 32 at the end. Now just have a look. There is an elastic IP. And I'm using the function join. So function, there is a function join that will concatenate two different values. <coughs> so how it's doing? It takes the value of a Bastion server private IP. All right, whatever the IP of the Bastion server, because we are passing the private IP. So it takes my server's private IP, and then it provides a slash 32. <laughs> So if I go to my stack area, if I click cancel and go to the North Virginia again, if I select this and check out the outputs, here you can see the range of my elastic IP Bastion IP is 172, 178, 1.176 slash 32. The output of this IP address is slash 32. 
this IP now, this value I can import in all the security groups that I want, wherever I want. So these are all the things. This is something that you need to go in such a deep and you need to figure out all this part. When you are trying, when you are saying that you are referring one thing to another thing and infrastructure level, you need to make sure that all the things are configured in such a way that they are accepted in a programming language as well. Right? We only on we trying for many times and deep diving in it, we'll be able to understand it. Pardon? Hello? Hello? Maybe if you practice a couple of times and we need to deep dive into this more and more, only then we will get this. Yes, of course. With a single case, definitely you won't be able to do that. You need to do practice a lot on this cloud formation specifically. And I tell you, every time whenever you are dealing with your client or even if you are dealing with your own product, every time you need to go through this cloud formation. Your okay. client will accept sales that you need to design the entire infrastructure with this cloud formation. And that's the best practice that you need to follow. All right. Yeah. Now, the last part of this cloud formation that is metadata. That is the way that we have designed this interface. Right. That is also important. Because what happens when you have a list of parameters, it is not mandatory always that the way that you are asking the parameter in the same way it will be delivered. You are asking for the VPC name, then you are asking the CID name. It's not always mandatory that the way that you are delivering the same way that you will receive on the cloud formation console. So here we are designing an interface, AWS cloud formation interface. And the first interface is parameter group. So what groups we are creating is the first group that we are creating is a VPC. And now in this VPC group, what are the parameters that you want to include? CID, a name, name, retention in days, traffic type. What are the different parameters you have? I'm including all this information here. Then my next label is public subnet. And what are the options I require is every zone subnet CID that I provided here. Then we have management subnet. What information do you require? that I pass it here and the management server server related information which I need to ask user I have asked in a single bunch so that if an end user is not well aware of the AWS then that person also can differentiate the things and easily pass the information due to the fact that whenever we are creating this kind of stack Whenever I creating this tag, if you noticed, then all this information is having a description. VPC range, enter VPC range, enter the name for VPC, specify the name. If, if you don't know what is flow logs retention prayer, then I have defined in a special way that is specify the number of tests that you want to retain the VPC flow log. Okay, this is for the VPC flow logs. You can easily map the things. Enter the range for the public subnet. Enter the range for the private subnet. Now here again, management subnet name. So enter the subnet name. Note, name is preceded by management. What does it mean? Can you tell me? Note the name is preceded by management and how you can achieve this. Hello, you guys here? Hello, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the question is, what is what is this name is preceded by management and how you can achieve this?
Similarly, here enter the name of an tag on your EC2 server, and here also the name is preceded by Bashan. So what does it mean? Can you show the code? Code, okay. That's no code is there. Yeah. All right, here is the code. There is a passion tag. There is a passion yeah, submit. And as a submit name, name is preceded by management. What does it mean? The submit name starts with management. Correct. The name the name of a submit starts with the management. Whatever you give okay. name, management hyphen, whatever the name will be, you will specify that will be applicable. Now, how you can achieve this? How you can use join. You can use the function join and you can customize the things. Now, why do you think this is required? Giving a name as a management, why this is required? To identify the subnet for the sub subnet for which um, for we are using. Uh, once the system is designed, now when you go to the AWS console and you see there are different kinds of EC2 machines available, there are a list of 5, 10 different EC2 machines. And if you do not have any name proper, then it becomes very difficult to identify which server, what is the server and for which services belongs to. Similarly to all the VPCs and subnets. So it's very important you should describe the tags here properly. Here the volume termination protection. So what exactly it is? So here uh, there is a description that select true if the volume that is needs to be retained for server deletion. So if you select this option, it means that you don't want to delete the EBS volume. You just want to delete the EC2 machine. All the features that you can describe it here. Let me know again if you have any questions and doubt in this cloud formation part. <laughs> yeah, maybe we will uh, we will practically assess these things and educate the team. Yes, this is very important. Unless you go practically deep dive into this cloud formation, you won't get it. What exactly it is? Because I can assure you, if you miss a single comma, if you miss a single braces, it will ruin your happiness of designing this cloud formation template. This requires a lot of practice. Every single piece of code you will find on the AWS documentation. You don't need to run, uh, uh, remember all this part. There is a lot of descriptions available on each of these uh, resources. You need to just copy the code and customize the way that you want. Now, again, if you don't know about one of the services, like let me just show you about the instances. Now, when you are creating an EC2 instance, these are the all the information which is required to input. Now, this is not mandatory to always include all this information. If you are unaware of this information, you just need to click on this particular file uh, link and you will get the information. For example, now for creation of an EC2 instance, I don't know what is this additional info and I don't know what is the affinity. So if I click on affinity, it gives me information about the affinity, what affinity is. So it indicates whether the instance is associated with a dedicated host. If you want the instance to always restart in the same host or not. Now this is a condition, it is very restrictive. Now, do you require this to include in your uh, CloudFormation code required? No, which means if I skip this parameter, 
then also I will be able to easily launch my machine. So you need to look into all these features and then design a template. Ability zone, the ability zone of the instance. Now this is not required, of course. The ability zone is not required. If I select, select a subnet, if I have a subnet, then I don't require to create an ability zone. You can try creation of a subnets, EC2 machine, then load balancer, auto scaling, everything. All right. Any other question in doubt in this part? Uh, I'll just take a minute. If you have any doubt, let me know. I'll just come back in a minute. Yes, guys, anything with respect to the cloud formation? All right. So now let's see the next AWS service is Lambda. Now Lambda is just similar to your EC2 machine, but there are a lot of variations available in both the services. If you want to configure an EC2 machine, that is up to you, that you need to create an EC2 machine, you need to configure that EC2 machine with that particular platform, maybe Node.js, maybe Python, maybe Java, and then you need to deploy your code and then it will be available for you. Now with respect to the cost wise, when you have an EC2 machine, let's say you are running a website on your EC2 machine. So you need to run this website, you need to run this EC2 machine for 24 by seven. Correct, because this is a website. Anytime a user can visit to your site. So you need to run 24 by seven. So definitely you need to pay for 24 by 7 whatever the price associated to that instance type you need to pay for that so let's assume a scenario you are having an application running a critical application running and to this critical application in the 24 hours of span only 10 requests you are receiving just for the 10 requests you need to run the server 24 by 7 this is the application maybe a banking application or e-commerce application you are running now for this purpose only 10 requests is coming and for that you need to run an ec2 machine 24 by 7 so of course this is a not cost optimized solution so what you can do is you can enable this lambda function a lambda is basically a back-end processor or where your logic and the business logic are being executed on this Lambda function, you cannot execute any front-end part. Whatever the GUI you want to describe, whatever GUI you want to present, that part is not possible on Lambda. Lambda can be only used for the backend purposes. So now, on this Lambda function, you don't need to create any server. You don't need to maintain any server. You don't need to configure any server. While creation of this Lambda, you need to just specify the platform that you want to use. The Python platform, the Node.js, or the Java, whatever the platform you want to go, you need to select that platform and then just deploy your code. So here, as there is a no server, 
as there is a no maintenance of the server you are also not got you, are, you will also not get charge for creation and using of this server so if we take a example of again 24 hours of span and if you are getting only 10 requests now then here you need to pay only for the 10 times whatever the fee of the 10 executions what the number of minutes the number of milliseconds the code will be executed you need to pay for that period only so instead of paying for 24 by 7 even if you are getting only 10 requests now here you will pay only for the 10 requests on which the invocation was introduced so this is like more cost optimized solution and the best part is AWS offers you 1 million requests per month for free. You will not get charged for the execution of first starting 1 million requests. So what are the benefits? First of all, for the 24 hours of span, you don't need to pay anything for the creation of the resources, for the managing of the resources, you only pay. For the invocation you did and the number of hours of number of milliseconds of duration the code is executed <coughs> correct now a lambda is not a serverless a lambda is a serverless lambda doesn't have any server so it cannot be directly executed you need to invoke this function can you guys tell me what is function in our programming language <coughs> Hello? Hello? Can you guys hear me? Same piece of code you can use for the multiple time or reuse them. Correct. Same piece of code you can execute it multiple times. And how to use this function? How to execute this function? Maybe. You need to call this function in your yeah. main function. You need to call this function and then this function will be called. Correct. So yes, in a yes. similar way, the Lambda is a function. So you need to always invoke this function to execute this function. So this, there will be one invoker and there will be one executor. I'll show you. So to create a function, you just need to click on create a function. And let's say here I define name uh, demo function one. Now there are different kinds of, uh, if you want to start from a scratch, you can go with that. There's a blueprint available, which uh, like for the different kinds of services, you can get it here. And these are serverless repositories also a certain for the Alaska skills, hello world program, etc., etc. So what exactly it is? Uh, so we will not go through all these things. We'll go from a scratch, define a name, demo one. Let's just go with a Node.js. What platforms you have is .NET, Go language, Java 8, Node.js, Python, Ruby. Then these are the different other versions available. And then you click on create a function. All right, so here we have our first Lambda function, which is created. This is a function code. And this is your main function, export.handler async. All right. Now, there is required of one trigger, and there is a one required of an executor. A trigger is something who invokes this function. It can be any of the services. It can be an AWS API gateway, IoT devices, application load balancer, DynamoDB, Kinesis, or S3. These are long list available. I can take it as a consideration. So when I say S3, so it's like if any kind of bucket object is being created, let's say we have uploaded a file. If that file we want to process in the Lambda function, then you can write an object for this event. So as soon as the object is created, this Lambda function will be invoked. 
if you have a load balancer and anything comes into the load balancer this lambda function will be invoked so they will be required an invocation for the lambda function so that becomes your trigger and now once this trigger is done the lambda function will execute the program and once this program is executed where you want to show the output do you want to show the output in the function console do you want to write the data into the dynamo db do you want to execute the sns notification do you want to execute a scs sqs what all the services that you want to create that you need to define it here so the input is here the output is here and the execution is your function here is your first line of code the entire uh, editor available file edit find view the way that you write your code here you will get it now in case if you want to provide the environment variables you can define your environment variables here you can define your tags again then here you have execution role that is you want an im role to mention that this lambda can have access to other aws services can invoke to other aws services that role you need to define here if you want to put into one of the vpc you can specify that vpc now to execute each function how much of ram you will require how much of memory you will require that you can allocate if it is a big application then you can specify the limit here minimum 128 gp 128 mb to maximum to 308 mb for the execution of a single function and the time off for the number of seconds you need to execute this function all you can you know, define your permissions here now debugging and error handling in case of anything goes wrong or if you want to do error handling then how you will you process that information so let's say for exe while execution of this function there is some kind of error occur so in case if you want to process this error then you can process in the sqs or you can send a notification to your team member that this kind of action is occurred now the last part in this here is a concurrency and if you remember our dynamo db section then we have seen the shards can you guys tell me what is shards in our dynamo db that we have discussed Yes, anyone? What is shards that we have discussed in the Dynamo DP? Uh, different systems. Um, Sorry? Different systems. Uh, database engines, different database engines. Uh, no. For de no, for Shards. database scalability. Yes, scalability. The compute capacity. Capacity, yeah. yeah. No, it uses different computes, right? So what happens is, is uh, whenever there is a compute capacity increase, it automatically increases, and whenever it is decreased, it automatically decreases. Like you can see here, whenever you create yeah. a lambda function, a single part of a compute capacity is reserved for that function. Now, if there is a high spike on this lambda function, uh, and a uh, single uh, compute capacity cannot uh, hold uh, this uh, a load yeah. then it will create another compute capacity mm -hmm. and balance the load between them so each of these compute capacity is called as shards and you can add and you can automatically add multiple shards as it requires correct the same works for your lambda function the lambda function is also having this kind of shards and each of these shards can be connected automatically whenever the spike requires so this is called as concurrency now aws in all aws account gives you thousand concurrency that is thousand shards approximately you can consider how many concurrency do you want to include for this function let's say you have five ten different uh, lambda functions and if you want to specify that a lambda function can be scaled to a certain limit then you can define this limit here let's say this is a very small function and i just i don't want to scale more than five concurrency so if you are having a high spike on this lambda function then it will scale and meet the requirement with the five concurrency 
when the fire consistency is reached to this maximum threshold, then the function will not work. Then. So this is concurrency, the number of shards you require. Now to test the function, you need to configure the test function. Uh, as this is our test function, so I will go with the test only. Create and click on test. And it says the execution result is succeeded and the output that we get is hello from the lambda. So in this way, you can execute this function. Now, whenever trigger is happened, this kind of function will be generated, function will be uh, calculated, the function will be executed. This is how the function works. Now, here you can see, to execute this lambda function, it took 97 milliseconds. And the minimum duration of the billing is 100 milliseconds. So I will here charge for the 100 millisecond for one request. And as we get one million requests for, per month for free, so here we will not get any charges for here. All right. Okay. Any question, any doubt in this part, you can change the runtime. You can specify the runtime here, whatever you want. These are called as lambda functions. Now, designing your architecture that have a lambda function is one of the best practices again, because more and more companies are now removing their services from an EC2 machine and they are shifting to the lambda function because of this cost optimized solution. Now, can you di differentiate the things? If you have a program running on EC2 machine, the backend services, and a backend service running on a Lambda function, what kind of benefits that you can achieve? Uh, EC2 machine, the service has to be running. And in Lambda function, whenever uh, we want the request only the, at that part, at that time, uh, the utilization will be there. Correct. Anything else? It's a server based, serverless. Serverless. Okay. So you don't have to worry about availability here. Yes, of course. And also, uh, there's a flexible way of uh, accessing all the services in the Lambda function. Just a click of a button, we can just access all the services. And also, we can connect uh, the output to the even other services. Okay. What about the load balancer and auto scaling? Not required. Which is on AWS EC2 machine. We need to configure everything. Yes. We need to configure the auto scaling, load balancer, different kinds of load balancer, and make sure the security group is well organize and everything but on this lambda function we don't need to do all this work sure. so these are the different benefits there are a lot of other benefits also and that's why it's recommended you should uh, consider a lambda function as the best as a part of your infrastructure rather than going for a ec2 machine wherever required so we have seen an example of our S3 metadata. Whenever a file is uploaded, the metadata was created by an SNS and delivered via SNS. Correct? We can we send out this data to our Lambda function and separate the data, whatever the information we require. Can we do this? Yeah. For example, ST, a resume is uploaded on ST bucket, and uh, as in, soon as the resume is uploaded, it will send a notification to the Lambda function. Lambda function will detect what kind of file it is and the information that we require, and then it will design one message and it send via SCS to the end user as well as to the 
HR manager. Can you do that? Yeah. So, what are the services you will require? What are the authentication you will require to achieve that? We need to uh, access to that uh, uh, permission access to the S3. Correct. And uh, uh, SNS. All right. I think only uh, two services is enough, I think. All right. So let's say. So in your Lambda function, how will you invoke AWS services? You have created a Lambda function, but now how will you create or how will you invoke SNS topic or SES topic? That is a very big challenge. Why are your code to access the services? Using the APIs. Uh, what kind of APIs? For example, if I'm going to use the Python, I'm going to use the Bundo APIs uh, to access the SNS services or uh, S3 services. Correct. So there is a Bundo library available through which you can achieve this part. It's very easy to achieve or it's very easy to uh, write a code with this Bundo language. All right. So now tell me guys, whatever the resources that we have studied, do you have any question, any doubt in this part? Fine, yes, everything is fine. Can we move forward? Okay. Yes, yes, move forward. Now here comes the important part of a AWS services, which is well architecture framework. And this is very important to understand for exam point of view and designing an infrastructure on the cloud. So even if you are not going for a certification and if you are going for a client visit and for taking up a project and you are consulting them to move to the cloud. So this information is very well required before you go to any client and uh, you know impress them to that is well architecture framework. It helps the architecture build the most secure, high performing, efficient infrastructure possible. So these are the well architecture framework that is defined by the AWS and the top solution architect. The way you should design the infrastructure and what are the things that you need to consider while designing the architecture. There are certain guidelines that is stop guessing the capacity. Stop really guessing the capacity. What will be the future? What how many servers you will require tomorrow? How many servers you will require after six months? What should be what will be the size of storage you will require tomorrow? You should focus on what resources. What is your current demand? If your current demand is 100 GB, then you should go for a 100 GB. You should stop thinking about what tomorrow you will require. Because on AWS, you can easily scale to whatever the limit you want. That's why. Second, automate to make the better experience. How will you make an, any services automatic? You can have auto scaling. You can write a Lambda function. So whenever things goes wrong, it can throw you notification as well as it can create a resource for you. You can automate this part. Test your system. Once you have designed your system, you can test your system with different configuration as we have discussed in our EC2 that if you are not aware of which EC2 instance you should go, you can create an EC2 machine with the list configuration and then you can try. If it not succeeded, then you can uh, move to the higher version and improve through the game days. So what is game days? A game day is basically how much of utilization you made each day. 
for example you are running an e-commerce site and in on this e-commerce site you are getting high spike only on tuesday wednesday and thursday out of seven days a week you are getting only high spike three days so you should understand this game days and based on that you can customize your architecture like on this wednesday thursday and friday you are having a high spike which will require four servers at a time and for the rest of the days you will require only one server or two server so what you can do is you can start with one server of your ec2 machine and then you can do auto scaling with the schedule infrastructure you can schedule that when you want to increase the size of your infrastructure so at that time you can specify weekly wednesday thursday and friday at morning 8 am you should make the twice of my infrastructure that is increase the ec2 machine size by four till the end of the evening at 8 pm so from morning 8 am to 8 pm the size of the infrastructure will be four ec2 machine which will again go for thursday and friday and on saturday again you will have a normal workload so through this game days you need to understand this game days based on your infrastructure and then you can customize your design. Now, well architecture famous has four or five pillars. So, what are these pillars basically? That defines a, how strength of your architecture can be made. First is operational excellence. This is the ability to run and monitor system to deliver business value and to continually improve supporting the process and the procedure. So do you remember any of the services that we have studied so far that has the ability to monitor and run the system to meet the business value? And it also helps you to upgrade the services whenever you require. Any AWS services do you remember? Can we achieve this with CloudWatch, CloudFormation? No. Because it also helps you to continuously improve the supporting process and procedure that is you can easily update and remove the services that you want to include in your infrastructure. So going with the cloud formation is again a well architecture framework. Second security, the ability to protect the information system and the asset while delivering the business value through risk assessment and mitigation strategies. So including the security group, firewalls, NACL rules, bucket policies, access control list is very important to define. As well as the cloud trails, cloud watch services, whenever any kind of action occurred, then you should trigger the alarm. So configuration of alarm is again very important. Then the third pillar is the reliability, the ability of a system to recover from infrastructure or service disruption. Now guys, you tell me what is that particular service that helps you to achieve this reliability future? This is very easy. Yes, guys, this is the simplest. The ability of a system to recover from infrastructure or service disruption. If anything goes down, then it should be able to automatically recover from the failure. Replication. Uh, how? How you will replicate automatically? Yes, your answer is right. Replication, but how? In EC2 instance, uh, you're able to even configure like a different job. Yeah. Uh, availability zone. Yeah, availability zone. Different availability zones. 
that is high ability or let's say uh, one of the ability goes down one of the data centers goes down then how it will recover the infrastructure I have, we can use redshift node it's automatic one I have designed my infrastructure in two ability zone, AP South 1A and AP South 1B. Let's say AP South 1A is completely down, then how my system will recover automatically? Latency. Uh, latency. Latency. Okay, using latency. Uh, latency based routing policy. Ah, uh, routing. Yes, yes, yes. Then you need to maintain two different infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Let's say I have only one infrastructure in Mumbai, and that infrastructure is down. A uh, half of the resources is down. Then how it will automatically recover the data? If it's a master database, if it's a database, then if the database goes down, then how it will recover that data? If it is an EC2 machine, if an EC2 machine goes down into that particular region, into that particular database, then how the data will be recovered? How the system will recover itself automatically? Image. Snapshot. So using the snapshot, whether it will automatically create, let's say, uh, today at uh, 1 p.m., 1 a.m. in the, the night time, in the midnight, at 8 a.m., 1 a.m., the entire system is down. One of the LED goes down, and you are sleeping. So at that time, how the snapshot or how your infrastructure will automatically recover? During the night time, you are sleeping, you, the entire team is sleeping. Now infrastructure goes down. So at that time, how will it recover? How the system will automatically recover? The different routing things. Let's plan different type of routing option. One of the routing we can Is it life cycle? Sorry, once again. Life cycle. Life cycle. Yeah. How? Uh, what about auto scaling? Yes, exactly. Auto scaling. Auto scaling will make sure that you have sufficient number of servers to meet the requirement. Correct? So, even if your instances are failed, then auto scaling will help you to recover the new EC2 instances with new EC2 instances to make sure you have a sufficient number of servers to meet the requirement. Right? Okay. When it comes to the storage part, then having an automatic backups and snapshots will help you to achieve and recover your data. Correct? So these kind of strategies you need to always maintain. Then comes our performance efficiency. That is the ability to use the computing resources efficiently to meet the system requirement. So whatever the kind of uh, EC2 instance families you are using, you need to make sure that it's well suited for your application. If you are having a big complex applications, then you should go for a computing. If you have a frequent transition with your system, then you can go with memory optimized. So based on your efficiency of your system, you need to choose the perfect resources for your infrastructure. And lastly, cost optimized solution. That is the ability to run a system to deliver the business value at the lowest possible cost. Definitely this is required.
if you are giving any product if you are develop any product then the less the infrastructure cost the more the benefit you will get correct the difference between the cost value and the selling price right the selling price and the cost price whatever the biggest difference will be you will get the major majority of the profit so that's what you need to always think into this how you can optimize the cost the first is the operation of excellence that is the way that you can achieve this is via performing the operation as a code as we have just spoke the cloud formation is the first pillar of your uh, well architecture framework you can make a frequent small reversible changes that is you can easily update the services refine operation procedure frequently uh, whenever you do any kind of test environment you should frequently try this and update the service anticipate the failures if any kind of failure occurs then you should understand why the failures is occurred and then you should learn from all the failures this is what makes an operation excellence the key services is always the cloud formation second our pillar of security that is how to implement a strong identity foundation the first service I am the the more stronger the I am foundation you achieve. If you are having a team of AI, then you should give the access to the AI services only. Based on the user role, you should define the permission there. It's the first layer of foundation. Unable traceability. How you can achieve this? How you can achieve the traceability? Yes, guys, how you can enable the traceability? We have just seen the service. Cloud trail. Sorry, once again. Cloud trail. Exactly. Using the cloud trail services, you can achieve that traceability. What kind of actions a particular user is doing, you can trace all the services. Also, you can enable the VP flow log. VP flow log will also give you complete in and out control of your network. Apply security at all layers. What are the different layers of security? Where you can add, where you can add the different layers of security? Hello. Hello. Yes, guys. At what layers you can apply the security? Sorry, one second. Private IP. How a private IP on which the security can be applied? Uh, the question is apply security at all layers. So, what are the different layers where you can apply the security? Uh, the time of data transmission. Data transmission. Data What's transmission. There? Okay. Yeah. Uh, how will you apply the data transmission security? SSL certificates. SSL certificate, of course. Can you do also encryption? Oh, yes, yes, that's what encryption is. Yes. 
So SSL, if the information is been accessed on the port 80 or 443, then you can provide the SSL certificate. If within the system, if there is any transmission of data, at that time you can do the uh, encryption. Yes, what are the other layers of security? Security at the EC2 instance. What is the security at the EC2 instance? How you can control the input and the output of a secret of a EC2 machine? Yes, guys. It's only application, application group by this only can access. No, just try to understand there is a one EC2 machine. Now on this EC2 machine, I want to control the inbound and the outbound <coughs> who access to my services and who cannot access to my EC2 machine. How to control this? What is the job of a security group? <laughs> Rules. We can use the rules now. Security groups. Security groups at the instance level, right? Okay. So how you can control the inbound and outbound of a EC2 machine via security group, correct? And when you have a bunch of security groups in a single subnet, at that time you can apply NACL rule, network access control is right. So yes, these yes. are the different of security. If you are having a security, if you want a security at the VPC level, you can apply a virtual uh, VPC flow law. If you want to apply oh. security at the account level, you can apply it at the, the cloud trail. You can enable the cloud trail. So these are the different layers of security. Okay. Now this is the protect data in transit and address. So to protect the data in transit and address, you can achieve it by encryption of the resources. Next is people away from the data. Can you achieve this? Yeah, if you send in encryption mode, they cannot. Uh, okay. Keep people away from the data. So it's like instead of going for a manual automation manual auto scaling of your system can you do auto scaling can you enable this auto scaling which is offered by aws to automatically steal your infrastructure yes if i know that tomorrow i will require two or four more servers going to the ec2 section and manually doing and creation of two or more servers or doing with the auto scaling that whenever you require a two or more servers you can automatically do with this auto scaling so in this way when you do automation when you have automation you can keep people away from your data you don't require people to ha always have a manual interaction with your system prepare for the security events how you can achieve this security events by enabling alarm cloud watch alarm is used to create a security events so any kind of interaction happen to your one of the security services if one of your security logs are breach you can fire a security events which will configure and will throw you notification so this is the security related principles then you have reliability that is test recovery procedure though you have given all the recovery options that is automatic backup, auto scaling, and everything. It is always mandatory to test this procedure, whether this kind of things is working on your system or not. Automatically recover from failure, that is auto scaling, then RDS database system, you can go with Aurora. Aurora gives you option that if any kind of system fails, then it will automatically recover. 
scale of horizontal to increase the aggregate system availability, stop again guessing the capacity, and make change in automation. So using all these, you can increase the reliability of your infrastructure. Okay. And then we have a performance efficiency that is democratize advanced technologies. So the more the more advanced technologies you are implementing, you are having IoT and other AI and ML things. You can use the AWS managed services to implement the uh, cloud services on here. Go global in minutes. Use serverless architecture as we have discussed why the importance of having a serverless architectures. What is the importance of having the Lambda function? So it's one of the most performance efficient way. And the more you do experiment, the more you learn and the more you will be able to optimize the infrastructure. If you know the game days that when and how the resources are can be tackled and the price can be saved, the more you do such kind of experiment, the more you will be able to optimize your infrastructure. And last cost optimization that is adopt a consumption model. Now, can you define me what exactly it means? Adopt a consumption model. What is consumption model? Uh, whatever resource we are using, we have to use uh, full. Uh, sorry, one second. Whatever resource we are using, we have to use optimum level. Uh, no. It's more like uh, adopt a consumption model whatever is your current consumption of your infrastructure you should design your system accordingly if your requirement if your consumption today of your infrastructure is only 100 gb you should design the system that have 100 gb of system only don't think about what is your future requirement don't predict about tomorrow you will require 200 gb 400 gb and start paying today itself because okay. it pay as you go model the moment you start 200 GB, you need to pay for that. And you can easily upgrade to whenever you require. So you should stop assuming the future capacity and whatever is your current consumption, you should adopt that. Measure the overall efficiency, whatever the overall efficiency of your system that you have designed, you should measure that and you can look into the picture where you can optimize things. Stop spending money on data centers operation instead of paying to the data centers and for the managing all this data center, the person who will manage this data center. Instead of paying all these things, you can adopt the cloud technology, which will help you to save the cost because data center creation, creation of the hardware, configuration of the hardware, maintaining the hardware, it will cost billions of dollars. So instead of going that for that purpose, you can move directly to the AWS cloud. Then analyze and attribute the expenditure. The whatever your expenditure are on the AWS, you can look, analyze these things, and then you can figure it out where you can save the cost. Does this function is already required or not? And use managed and application services to reduce the cost of ownership. Now, what exactly it is? Can you define? Use management and application level services to reduce the cost of ownership. What do you mean by ownership? Application level services is like SQS. That by using that we can reduce email. Exactly. Email table. SMS exactly. is a simple message and email. We can and pay for one. Paying for so different. Domain, Correct. Uh, domain also domain. Can be. All right. So SQS, SNS, SES, Lambda function, then uh, 
elastic load balancer auto scaling if you go for a amazon managed services then the benefit you get is you don't need to maintain all the servers you don't need to maintain the services this is the job of amazon to maintain and to take ownership of these resources right you can also create your own queuing system you can also create your own push notification system you can also create your own load balancer and auto scaling future but if you do this then you need to design that servers you need to maintain that servers you need to take ownership of that server but if you use the amazon managed services then you don't need to you don't need to worry about the ownership of how to configure how to create all these resources you need to just create and attach to your infrastructure correct so in this way you can achieve the ownership uh, responsibility and give it to the aws <laughs> All right, so that's the end of our session and our course. So what's your overall review about this session? <laughs> we need to practice more. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yes. Yes, so what is your overall overview of the, this session? What you have learned? was good but we need practice and this yes of course you will require a lot of passive to understand and to do the practicals on this cloud formations and cloud services okay okay and uh, Lalit, uh, last uh, classes uh, link we didn't receive uh, uh, the video. Okay. 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 Hello. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you, Lalit, for your valuable uh, delivery, and we like the way we were uh, delivering the sessions. And, uh, thank you. Thank you for your. Uh, sure. Thank you so much, guys for joining and having a good time all of us thanks Ari. thank you so much all right thank you.